This is too high for me. So now we discuss positive and negative trials. Negative trials are much more interesting as compared with positive trials, but however. So when we read the trial, is a significant p-value enough? So what is the p-value? The p-value gives an idea about the risk of false positive if we choose 0 0.05. The risk of false positive is 5%. If it's 0 0.001, it will be 0 0.1. Percent. So we should consider that the p-value is not a categorical value, but it's a continuous value. So uh, we should reflect about this. Uh, we want to have a proof of treat in a trial. We want to have a proof of treatment effect beyond reasonable doubt. So it means that lower the p-value is better. It is. So actually, uh, this is a very nice publication. O -o 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 kind of classify the, 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 the level of evidence according to p-value, and as you can see, uh, a p-value less than 0 0.001 has been considered a strong evidence of treatment effect. Then another point is the trial is positive, but uh, how is the, the, the magnitude of treatment effect? I mean, the trial has to be positive, but then we have to uh, spend some money for, I mean, uh, if the, the trial works, uh, then we want to introduce the new drug in the, for the reimbursement in, in our healthcare system. I mean, the government has to pay for that. So uh, the magnitude of the treatment effect has to be uh, high to explain the cost of introducing this new drug in, uh, in our, for reimbursement in our, in our healthcare system. So this is an example. For example, it's the improve it trial. Of course, as we uh, observed, it was a positive trial. There was a, around a 6% reduced risk of the primary uh, endpoint patients using uh, ezetimibe uh, plus simvastatin as compared to those using uh, simvastatin as monotherapy. But uh, it's a 6% uh, relative risk um, uh, reduction in seven years, and if you compare the event rates in the treated and, uh, I mean, in patients using uh, ezetimibe and those using the, uh, the, 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 having the control, uh, enrolled in the control arm, there was just a 2% absolute risk reduction. So is a an absolute re risk that the reduction of 2% enough to uh, explain the costs related to use this drug for a reduction of cardiovascular events. And that's the reason why uh, the FDA put a black box on the on ezetimibe to reduce cardiovascular events because they consider a 2% reduction or risk within an, an, a 95 confidence interval of zero to four, not enough to justify the costs uh, of introducing this new drug in our daily um, uh, therapies to reduce cardiovascular outcomes in patients. Then another important, impo important point was, is, was the right outcome chosen for our trial. This is the ACCOR trial in which intensive therapy was compared to uh, intensive therapy for um, uh, reducing of uh, glucose was actually compared with standard therapy. And uh, as you can see in the, f in the figure on the left, actually uh, intensive therapy was significantly reduced, uh, was significantly improving glucose control in patients enrolling in the trial. But then if you check the number of outcomes on the right, you can see that the intensive therapy was associated with increased risk of outcome. So do you think that maybe uh, using uh, glycated hemoglobin as outcome in diabetic trial should not work? No, it doesn't work. It's important to assess hard outcome, cardiovascular outcomes, okay? So other important aspects to consider when we, um, uh, when we uh, read about uh, positive trials is 
our secondary endpoints are coherent with those of the primary outcome. If they are, it means we can be more confident about what we observed. It's the same for subgroup analysis. So if the, the, the results in subgroup analysis, it's actually similar to what happened in the main analysis, we can be more confident. So then we have to consider a simple side, the efficacy safety balance, uh, the design and the conduct of the trial. And then of course, we have to consider generali generalizability of the, of the results because it's a trial and there could be very strict inclusion criteria that then limit the use of the drugs in our real world population. But this is more interesting. Uh, so uh, what happens when trials fail? And currently there are several trials that failed and I think there are several important considerations that should be made. So the art failure is my field and is one of the fields with more actually trial that failed. So the first point is maybe the trial has failed because of wrong pathophysiology or, or, or the wrong target, for example. Uh, this is the case, for example, of acute uh, heart failure. Acute heart failure is, uh, is a syndrome, I mean, includes several syndromes. So it's really unlikely that the same drug is able to uh, reduce outcome in all the patients because acute heart failure is highly heterogeneous. So it's including several different diseases, we could say. So it's really unlikely that one drug can at the same time reduce outcome in all these patients. Then there is another important point. We are trying to use uh, drugs used in chronic heart failure for acute heart failure, but these are two completely different things. So uh, the pathophysiology may be wrong. And um, let's go on. Then we have to consider treatments and those. This is, for example, the case also always in acute heart failure for a Athena trial. In Athena trial, uh, high doses of spironolactone were compared with usual care. And actually, as you can see in this figure, there were no differences in outcome for high dose spironolactone versus usual care. But uh, some considerations should be considered. The first one is that uh, spironolactone and memory are naturetic in doses more than 50, but uh, up to 400 milligram, milligrams um, uh, per day. Uh, so maybe an higher dose could have been needed. Then another point was that in the Athena, uh, 100 milligram day of, daily uh, of high dose pyranolactone was reducing significantly uh, anti pro BNP levels in treated patients, this is very good, but there was the same reduction also in the, in the, in the control arm. So there was something bad, something wrong with the treatment. Another important point is that in patients treated with high doses pyranolactone, there were no changes in potassium and estimate glomerular filtration rate. And it's quite expected that patients receiving spironolactone uh, uh, can have issues with, issues with potassium and with actually a uh, renal function. And in patients treated with spinolactone, there were no safety issues. So maybe we should consider that maybe the dose of the drug was not enough. Maybe an higher dose was needed, that then maybe this is the explanation why this trial failed. Another point is, uh, for example, FPEF. FPEF has no treatment, all the trials failed. This is, this is the example, for example, of uh, I preserve trial. And uh, in I preserve trial, there was the feeling that maybe patients with FPEF enrolled had no FPEF. These were the inclusion criteria of the trial. So FPEF symptoms that are quite generical. So for example, patients with atrial fibrillation can, can have FPEF, can have F heart failure symptoms, but not have heart failure. Ejection fraction more than 45, hospitalization for heart failure during previous uh, six months in year class two or four, or not hospitalization for 
uh, heart failure and a class 3 4. But let's compare antiprobin P level in iPreserve with those in a registry. In iPreserve, we had 339 median antiprobin P levels. In the Swedish heart failure, we had 1428. It's a huge difference. So maybe this could, maybe the trial failed because it was not in really enrolling patients with FPEF. It is possible. Another point is uh, the wrong outcome. In, in, in this study, for example, we were um, comparing pioglitazone with placebo and as primary, uh, of course, in diabetic patients, and uh, as primary outcome was chosen the composite of mortality, not fatal myocardial infarction, stroke, acute coronary syndrome, leg amputation, coronary revascularization or revascularization of leg a very rich composite outcome, I would say. And a secondary outcome it was chosen the classical primary outcome using all the other studies, meaning the composite of that from any cause, not fatal myocardial infarction and stroke. So in this trial happened that the innovative primary outcome failed, but the classical primary outcome that in this trial was the secondary outcome was positive. So can we say that the trial was positive? Of course not, because the, 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 the trial was powered for the primary outcome. So this shows that sometimes it's very important to uh, choose which outcomes to include in the primary outcome that's usually a, a composite outcome. Because including more and more and more events can just generate noise and then we are not able to demonstrate any efficacy of the, treat, of the treatment that we are testing. Then of course, a trial conduct is a very important point. This is the, the case of the top, top cut trial where actually the trial was uh, neutral, but then at the sub-analysis there was efficacy in Americas, but not in, R in Russia, Georgia. And then it was showed that in patients uh, enrolled in Russia and Georgia, the current levels were almost nothing. And this explains uh, the lack of efficacy because patients were not using the treatment. And it happened more or less the same for the true HF trial recently in uh, acute heart failure uh, setting. So trial conduct is quite an important issue. So what about then the quality of a meta-analysis? We talked about this maybe two hours ago. So this is the, the major point. We, we just have to be careful about what we pull together because we could have a situation like this where we say that uh, fish intake has no uh, uh, effect in reducing heart failure, something like that. But some trial reduced the outcome, some in some trial uh, the, the exposure reduced the outcome, in some trial the exposure inc increased the outcome, in some trial it's neutral. So we are just pulling very different stuff and at the end we are not really sure about the result we get. Here the heterogeneity was 80% and the p-value was 0. 0.000. So really difficult to, to get uh, a, a result from this. And this is another point. I, I already talked about this. When we pull together uh, trials with very different uh, sample size. Of course, the meta-analysis will have the result of the, uh, the, the, the trial that enrolled more patients. So this can really make no much sense. So I think that with this I've done. So if there are any questions...